it's great to stand in this historic place of the dissection of corpses. And uh, we're not so much dissecting a corpse tonight as the soul of a man who could not bring himself to speak out publicly against the Holocaust. Now, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, Elie Weissel, who was a Holocaust survivor, sent this message to all uh, of that persuasion who dare not speak out against great evil. He said, take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victims. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. And this is a truth that applies to the silence of Pope Pius XII in face of the most heinous crime against humanity ever committed, even when it was taking place under his very windows. He never spoke out, he never lit a candle for Christian morality that should have shone in that blackness, a blackness that in consequence covers him as well. His silence gave license to Catholic members of the SS to shoot the Jewish men, women and children as they cowered on the edge of the mass graves. It, to turn on the gas in the concentration camp chambers and then to go to confession with an untroubled conscience. It encouraged the Germans in the belief that God was still on their side. We shall see how the Nazis desperately needed the Pope's silence for that very reason. They knew that any complaint by the pontiff would damage the war effort and slow the progress of the final solution. It gave so many Catholics the excuse not to help Jewish refugees, although many did. It gave some Catholics, including quite a few priests, the excuse to man the rat lines to help the SS criminals escape after the war to Latin America. The Pope's silence in face of this overwhelming evil was a deliberate choice. It was an immoral and counterproductive choice. How different this Pope was to the Catholic leaders who helped to scupper the Nazi plan in the 30s to liquidate the mentally ill. That was stopped when churchmen spoke out. If you want a moving argument against silence, read one Joseph Ratzinger, who tells of his childhood. Our entire village, he says, in Nazi Germany, experienced a sense of liberation when Cardinal Clement of Munich broke the silence and publicly defended the mentally ill who'd been marked for extermination. How many other Germans, a few years later, might have experienced a spiritual liberation had the Pope spoken up in similar terms for the Jews when they were marked for extermination? I don't suggest that Eugenio Pacilli was a Nazi. He was an upper-class Italian aristocrat who greatly feared the communists. The Pacilli estates uh, wouldn't have survived had they come to power in Italy. He shared the upper-class suspicion of the Jews Ingrained in him was the long-standing Catholic condemnation of the race as the sinners who had killed Christ. But test it this way. After the war, when it was safe to do so, right up to his death in 1958, Pacelli never said prayers for the Holocaust victims, not one measly requiem mass, and he totally opposed the state of Israel, refusing to recognize it. As for the six million Jews of Europe, he never lifted a bejeweled finger or stretched a vocal cord in their, uh, to save them. Why did he lack the moral principle to say loud and clear that the extermination of the Jewish race is wrong? When that Hockerth play raised this problem so dramatically in 1963, the first response of Vatican apologists was to claim that the Pope didn't know about it. When that didn't work, they tried another tack. Yes, he knew all about it, but he didn't act because he didn't want to make it worse. Well, how much worse could it be? He didn't act because he didn't want Catholics to suffer the same fate. Really, can you imagine Hitler, a Himmler, a communicant Catholic, gassing his own congregation? He didn't act, they say, because he had to stay neutral in case he had to broker a truce. No one ever asked him to broker a truce, and a truth, truce with Hitler that would leave the Nazis in place uh, was hardly on the cards after America entered the war. So let us examine these excuses in turn. The notion he didn't know 
ridiculous. He knew all about the Ustasha massacres of Jews in Croatia in 1941 because Anti Pavelic, the movement's founder, was a fervent Catholic. Instead of excommunicating him, he welcomed him to the Vatican. He was told of the final solution soon after it was planned at the Wawanzi Villa in February 1942. As one book says, quote, in all likelihood, the Vatican learned of the plan shortly after the Nazis decided it. Decided it. That's a quote from Hitler, the War and the Pope by Ronald Richlack, who'll speak next. It began in uh, Slovakia in March, the final solution, when 80,000 Jews, mainly women and children, were deported to certain death. Still, the Pope did nothing. Had he done anything, it would have had an effect, because Slovakia was a Catholic country, headed by President Joseph Tiso, who, believe it or not, was a priest. The Pope heard about the gas chambers from priests, from church officials, from Abbot Scavizzi, who was a, really a spy for the Vatican, uh, working with the Knights of Malta. He's told the Pope that the massacre of the Jews in Ukraine is by now nearly complete. Uh, and in October, he said that two million Jews had already been killed. By that time, the Pope knew of the special camps with the gas chambers, informers from the Waffen-SS and the German military intelligence, passed a talk along the Italian ambassador to Berlin, told him that even the SS talk openly about the executions. Bishop von Preysing, one of the Pope's closest friends, begged him to speak out to save the Jews of Berlin who faced, quote, certain death. But, uh, of course, he didn't, and the Vatican records show that by the end of 43, early 44, they were speaking of four million Jews lost in Eastern Europe. But even then, the Pope said nothing at the end of the war when it was entirely safe to do so. By speaking out then, he might have moderated those final inhumanities in the camps, and he would certainly have discouraged priests and Catholic lay people from helping the Nazis to escape justice. And it's not credible to claim that his neutrality was justified in order to broker a truce. No one ever asked him. The apologists claim that papal condemnation of the gas chambers would have made Hitler so angry that he would have killed more Jews, or perhaps even bombed the Vatican. But this is nonsense. According to all we know of German diplomacy and strategic thinking, the Pope's neutrality was central to the Nazi strategy. It was essential to keep their soldiers believing that God was on their side, or at least on both sides. And it would shatter that belief if they heard that the Pope was not. Now let's consider the case of the Roman Jews, 85% saved, oh yes. Those arrests when the Germans came in and rounded up a thousand Jews a big danger. We have Ribbentrop, the foreign minister, and his envoy at the Vatican, von Weizsäcker. And we know what they said to each other because we've got their telegrams. Von Weizsäcker telegrams Ribbentrop, stop Himmler arresting uh, Jews in Rome or the Pope might make a public stand which will serve anti-German propaganda. Unquote. Really nervous that the Pope might speak out. You see, this had become a propaganda war, the Allies against the Axis, democracy against fascism, for the future allegiance of the world. It's not like the First World War, where at Christmas on the Somme, the contending armies would sing Silent Night and play each other at football and make believe God was on both sides. This was a deadly ideological battle, and the question of the Pope was the question of whether God sided against the extermination of the Jews. And that is why, the Nazis so desperately wanted the Pope to say, stay silent. And why von Weizsäcker warned Ribbentrop that the roundup in Rome might push him over the edge. Listen to his telegram to Ribbentrop about the, the roundup of the first thousand Jews. The curia is dumbfounded, particularly as the actions took place under the very windows of the Pope. The reaction could be muffled if the Jews were employed in labor camps in Italy i.e. not sent to the gas chambers. Our enemies are turning the action to their own advantage to force the Vatican to drop its reserve. Well, 
The first deportation happened at dawn. On October the 18th, 1,023 Jews were crammed into freight cars and transported to Auschwitz. 820 of them were gassed within a week. Only 17 returned. Throughout it all, the Pope stayed silent, resisting all the pressure to condemn this wicked operation. And von Weizsäcker was delighted. He telegrammed Ribbentrop, the Pope triumphantly, the Pope has not allowed himself to be stampeded into making any demonstrative announcement against the removal of the Jews from Rome. He's done everything he could, even in this delicate matter, not to injure the relationship between the Vatican and the German government, i.e. the government and its extermination policy. That telegram says it all. The Pope did everything to help the Nazis and nothing to help the Jews by signaling through his silence that God, of whom he was the representative on earth, did not object to genocide. He discredited and betrayed his own God. If he'd protested on the 18th of October, those freight cars jammed with Jews may not have left the station. The train might have been diverted to Mauthausen, which had no gas chamber. The Italian resistance might have been emboldened to attack and release the prisoners. Had the Pope condemned the evils of Nazism, the Holocaust might have been halted just as the mental defective uh, elimination program was disbanded after Catholic leaders in the 30s had done it. It said that Pope Pius feared that the, if he condemned them, the Nazis might bomb the Vatican, take him prisoner. Well, that would be an admission of cowardice, or at least a concern to save the wealth and splendor of the church by doing the wrong thing. The documents show there was never any danger that the Nazis would attack. All they asked of the Pope was his silence, and they received it. Not all popes, of course, are bad or incapable of moral understanding. Pope Pius XI, Achille Ratti, who'd allowed fascist flags to fly in his cathedral in the early days, after Kristallnacht and the Italian race laws, commissioned three leading Jesuits to draft an encyclical. Right. Yes, oh, it, it remained on his desk when he died. His successor, his successor never issued it, uh, the unity of the human race, uh, the encyclical against Nazism. Uh, racism spread its poison, unchecked and undiluted, by a man who claimed to be the world moral leader, Mr. Pacelli, the bad Samaritan.